Yes. We have John Roberts who is available to us. He is at the White House. I believe you have some new developments, John. Yeah, you know, I had spoken with Rudy Giuliani just as the, the whole news of the plea uh, deal uh, for Michael Cohen was coming down. He, he didn't seem worried about it at all, telling me that uh, none of this is connected to the president because Cohen had said on multiple occasions that the president knew nothing about the payment to Stormy Daniels. But now we have in this plea agreement information that in two payments to silence women, according to the deputy U.S. attorney uh, Robert Kuzami, uh, that were done at the behest of a uh, candidate uh, and in coordination with a candidate to silence two women. One was a payment of $150,000, which was called an illegal corporate contribution. You'll remember that Karen McDougal, uh, the ex-Playboy playmate, was paid $150,000 by the National Enquirer for her story. Uh, and then, of course, we had the payment of $130,000 on October the 27th to Stormy Daniels. Well, Giuliani told me a short time ago that none of this was connected to the president, but Cohen said in, in court documents that he signed that he did this at the direction of and in coordination with a candidate for federal office. Now, unless there's some candidate for federal office that we haven't heard about that Cohen had been working with, that would suggest that President Trump might be that federal candidate. And let's not forget that Cohen has a recording of himself talking with President Trump about a possible payment to Karen McDougal, uh, a payment that uh, the president's attorney said was never made, or well, wasn't made by President Trump, but there was money that was exchanged between the National Enquirer and Karen McDougal. So putting together the pieces of this, as Ed Henry was saying, uh, this guilty plea by Michael Cohen could be problematic for the president. It's not about the Russia investigation, but Cohen says these payments were made to influence the outcome of the election. So, you know, these special counsel investigations have a habit, as, as you know from your time here at the White House, Dana, of going in directions uh, that they were never intended to at the beginning and finding something where it's believed that there was nothing there before that had nothing to do with the original mandate. And it looks like we could be moving in that direction, Dana. John, I have a question, though. So if Michael Cohen apparently says uh, he did this on the behest of a federal candidate, and if President Trump's lawyers say, well, wasn't us, then where's the remedy? I mean, maybe that just remains a, to me, that's unclear what happens in that instance. Well, well, I mean, here's the thing that we don't know, and we don't know partially because we don't have the full court documents yet. Did, did Cohen only tell prosecutors that he did it at the direction of and coordination with a federal candidate? Or did he tell the prosecutors who that person was and federal prosecutors in this plea agreement have, uh, for the moment at least, left that person anonymous because it may become part of another uh, or bigger case. Uh, we, we don't know yet because we, we don't have those documents in hand. But it leaves an open question as to who is telling the truth here. Was Michael Cohen telling the truth when he said that President Trump didn't know anything about this payment to Stormy Daniels? Or uh, are, you know, is, is, is this idea that uh, President Trump knew all about it, the truth. We, we just don't know at this point. We certainly don't. Does anyone else have any questions, Dagan? John, just really quickly, because again, this was not an investigation led by the Mueller team. Mm -hmm. It was handed off to the Southern District of New York. So it was completely handled by them. So th is there any indication of what coordination has been with the Mueller team? What information they might have access to past, present, and future? Well, I mean, the Mueller investigation is going to have probably, I would think, access to all of the information that the prosecutor from the Southern District of New York does because it's all part of the Department of Justice. Uh, what we don't know at this point is, is whether or not this is going to get kicked back to Mueller and might it get kicked back to Mueller in the sentencing phase of things. We were told going into this by sources familiar with the plea deal that Cohen had agreed to plead guilty in exchange for three to five years in prison. He's facing counts, these eight counts, which could land him in prison for 65 years, and the judge left it ambiguous in, in court. He said the sentencing would be on December the 12th, and uh, I mean, the indications were from the court that Cohen could be up for the uh, all of the sentences on all of the counts. So there's another disconnect here as well between what we were told about the parameters of a plea agreement and now leaving this open, uh, it would seem, by the judge. Now, could that mean 
that federal prosecutors may use the leverage of 65 years of, in court against Michael Cohen to fill in some of the details there. But again, Dagan, uh, when you look at either the Manafort case or you look at the Cohen case, this has gone far afield of what the initial mandate of the Mueller investigation was, and that was to look into whether or not there was collusion between the Trump campaign and operatives in Russia to influence the outcome of the election. But this Cohen plea deal would suggest that there was an attempt to influence the election, at least on his part, by making payments to these two women, who we believe are both Karen McDougal, the ex-Playboy playmate, and, and uh, Stormy Daniels, to keep them quiet so that they didn't come out with anything that was detrimental to a candidate and the only candidate that they would have been talking about was Donald Trump prior to the election. So this thing is kicked into a, an entirely different direction. And I think uh, by virtue of this Cohen plea agreement kicked into a much higher gear than it was before. Well, they said they wanted to wrap it up by September 1st and it's August 21st. So we're getting closer. One last question for you from Juan Williams. So, John, the, in both cases, Manafort and Cohen, it would look like leverage now exists for mm -hmm. Robert Mueller. Uh, but I'm not clear on exactly how he uses that. What? Are, let's move the story forward. What happens next in terms of Mueller trying to reach out to Lanny Davis, who is the lawyer for Michael Cohen, or reach out to Paul Manafort's lawyers at this point and say, 80 years is a long time, gentlemen. Uh, this man is not a young man. Let's make a deal. I mean, I think that there is, there is a lot of, of leverage there. If you're Robert Mueller and you, you say to Paul Manafort's attorney, Kevin Downing, look, your guy could go away for the rest of his life, but uh, we're prepared to offer uh, him leniency if he helps us out with this investigation. And, and the same entreaty could be made to Michael Cohen unless when we see, finally see this plea agreement, they did nail down this idea of three to five years, which we were told going into this uh, they did. In that case, Mueller wouldn't have uh, a whole lot of leverage. But if you're dangling lengthy prison sentences, which mean you'll likely die in prison over two individuals who are used to living lavish lifestyles in, uh, in big cities. That's an awful lot of leverage to get somebody to cooperate. Now, it's unclear what either one of them might know about you know, the topic at hand, which again was Russia collusion or whether there was obstruction of justice. Uh, but he, he does have a, a, a pretty big carrot to dangle in front of their noses. All right, John Roberts at the White House, thank you for that reporting. Thank you to Ed Henry and to Peter Ducey.